faithfulness to generations is here, he's faithful, he's good, he's kind. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your cup.
Come on, church, let's lift it up even higher. Come on, he's worthy. He's worthy of that praise. Amen. There's much to be praised, to praise him for today, not just because of who he is or what he's done, but I would go even so far if you would even allow for yourself to praise him for suffering. That's a hard thing to praise him for, isn't it? Suffering. But we all go through a variation of suffering in our lives, some very extreme, some very little. Just yesterday, I mean, my face isn't red for no reason. I had to go to the ball fields all day and watch T-ball. It's really cute, but it's really painful to watch. And that's just a small version, but Jesus himself is acquainted with our grief and our sufferings. Even the night he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he pleads with his father three times, three times. If you could take this cup of suffering, let it be so, but Lord, your will be done. In other words, if I don't have to endure the cross, if I don't have to endure the shame, the consequences of sin for this entire world, let it just pass. But I will do it because I love them that much. So let's take the cup out. Let's prepare our hearts for communion. This is the cup of suffering. And this side of the cross, when we experience suffering, we know it's not in vain when it's for Christ because of this. Because his suffering produced salvation and life and eternal glory for him. And we get to actually experience his grace in suffering healing and suffering. Before Christ, suffering just produces more suffering, more pain, even death. But we have an eternal hope. And that's why we sing hallelujah. Because even in suffering, we are set free. So let's take the bread. It's his body that was beaten, that was punished for you and me. Let's, it's eaten. His blood poured out. Let's drink. Let's pray together. So Jesus, we praise you today because you are faithful. Faithful to the even point of suffering. You know our grief. You know our sorrow. You understand our pain. Lord, you went through the worst of pain. But you did it because you loved us so much that you wanted us to be home with you. And so we thank you for the temporary sufferings that we deal with because it will produce good things in our lives. Just as James puts it, we consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds because the, the testing of our faith produces perseverance, which will finish its work by making us mature and complete. So make us mature and complete in you today. Help us to know you deeply. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's have a seat. The General Assembly has now adjourned for the year. Welcome. Hey, I just want to say before we get into the Word of God today that no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, uh, there's a Creator who made you. He loves you. And you are in this moment for a reason. The God who made you is drawing you to Himself to strengthen you, to encourage you today. Uh, church, I just want to celebrate that two weeks ago at Easter, because you all invited and served and prayed, uh, we had a moment where people prayed to receive Christ as their Savior, and then they raised their hand to indicate if they did that. I got to look out and make eye contact with so many of those people, teenagers, college students, retirees, moms, dads, 
And uh, that number, uh, when we looked back and counted all the hands, is 318 people who placed their faith in Christ. So can we just celebrate that together? God is at work, and uh, he's at work in you and through you. And I want to speak for a moment to those of you who were here and you raised your hand. Or maybe Easter was your first time with us, or uh, this whole God thing or church thing is something new and fresh that God is doing in you. You know, Jesus said that to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And sometimes you'll hear Christians use that phrase, born again. And, and the idea is this, we're all born physically, we have a birthday, but that moment in your life when you place your faith in Jesus, you are born spiritually. And we want to make sure if you are a spiritual newborn that we help give you all the nutrients, all the training that you need to grow in Christ and fully enjoy your life in Christ. One of those steps is what we call baptism. It's a picture, maybe you've heard from different churches, uh, you know, some of them sprinkle, some of them this, some of them that. For us, it's not like a religious tradition. It's a spiritual moment that marks your spiritual birthday. Uh, that you've died to the old way of life and you've been raised to a new life. So two weeks from today, we'll be having baptism at all our services. So over there at Avon, over at Fishers, right here at Brownsburg. Uh, even if you're online, if you've not yet been baptized, you can reach out to an online host. We've had people fly here, drive here to be baptized. We've also had times that we've gone to people who are in our online audience to help them take this next step. Now, if you've never seen this before, it might seem intimidating, so we want to invite you to explore this. Hop on your web browser, go to cp.news, click on baptism, and you can learn about it. And if you've never seen it before, at the very least, make sure you're here in two weeks so you can see this, because uh, what happens, we don't make you talk in front of a bunch of people or anything like that, uh, but the worship team will be leading the church in a time of worship baptisms are happening simultaneously and everyone's just clapping and cheering because we're celebrating eternal life we're celebrating this promise that through jesus we know we can have an eternal life in fact that's what jesus said in john 3 verse 6 he said flesh gives birth to flesh in other words if you've born been born physically we all have great good for us you have a birthday but you'll also have a funeral but Spirit gives birth to spirit. When you place your faith in Christ, you are born spiritually, and now you've got a whole new life ahead of you. So we're just so excited for those of you who are new believers among us. If you're here and you are a follower of Jesus, but you've never been baptized for yourself as your decision, uh, some of us, our parents did that for us when we were little, the way Jesus talks about it is it's a volitional choice of your will. So if you've never made that choice, you can also explore baptism and make sure you're here in two weeks. It's one of the best ways to tell your friends about your relationship with Jesus, to invite them to come and be part of your baptism. Well, we're kicking off a series today called Satisfied. And, you know, maybe the best picture of what this whole series is about, and this series will go from today all the way up to Memorial Day, uh, is a story of one of my two daughters. I've got two girls and one boy, and when one of my daughters was about six years old, we were at a restaurant that had the pictures on the menu, real classy, you know, had the pictures of what it is, and she picked something based on the picture, and both her mom and I knew that once it arrived, she would not like it. But this picture just sold her. She was sure it would be the most satisfying thing, and so you know, we said, hey, you know, this costs money. If you get it and you don't like it, you're still going to have to eat it. We're not sure if you're going to like it. Do you still want to get it? Yes, 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 I want to get it. And, you know, so she places the order and the food comes out and her eyes are so big and she's so excited. And she takes that first bite. And you can just see the emotions on her face of disappointment but also realizing I told mom and dad I would eat all of this and a little bit of embarrassment and, and even shame to the point that I'm like okay don't worry you don't have to eat it it's okay we're gonna we're gonna let this one slide but have you ever had that feeling in life we all do and this series is one of those series that hits pretty hard it's a little different than what you might normally hear because here's the deal we don't want you to get to the end of your life and realize that what you filled your plate with wasn't the right stuff. And so if today seems deep, 
it's intentional. This whole series is based on a book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes. It was written before God came to earth in the person of Jesus. Here's a representative verse of Ecclesiastes in chapter 7 where it says, Hey, are you a wedding crasher? Do you love going to parties? You love just having a good time? Guess what? You're better off to go to a funeral than to go to a wedding. Why? Because it makes you realize my life will also end. What am I doing with my life? So that's the kind of wisdom that we're encountering. Now, I'm pumped. I get to teach this series next week all the way to Memorial Day. But God actually brought the book of Ecclesiastes into my life in a really profound way this last summer. I was with my family at a Christian family camp where it's pretty much like church seven days a week. But it's the only time I get to go to church and I just get to sit there. And if something's going wrong, I don't have to worry about it. And uh, there's this speaker. He's a friend of me and Mel's. His name is Richard Dahlstrom. Uh, he has a Solomon-like wisdom to him. He has a really profound way of presenting God's word. And this message that you're about to hear from Richard, it hit me so hard this last July and in such a good, good way. That as I prayed about bringing the book of Ecclesiastes to all of you, it was actually because of this message that inspired me. I've got to bring this wisdom to our whole congregation. Uh, so if you'll prepare your heart, I know God is going to speak to you in a really profound way. Uh, Richard is from Seattle. He's a retired lead pastor of a church of about our size. He's an incredible man of God, but he traveled all the way here. It's a three-hour time difference. Will you guys give him a huge round of applause and just show him some, some connection point love? Come on out, Richard. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Love you, brother. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real privilege to be with you here in Indiana. As uh, John said, I'm from Seattle, so I brought the rain on Wednesday. Uh, it's okay. I'm leaving. The sun is back, and the rain will follow me back home to where it always rains. It's a joy to be here, too, this particular week, right? Because Indiana was like front and center nationally. Uh, Monday night, I cheered for Purdue, and then I was sad with you uh, to see the disappointing loss. And then uh, we also, Monday morning, watched the eclipse at the Indy 500 Speedway from our house, and it was a joy to see that event. If you'd like to know a little bit about me, I could summarize this way, four, three, two, one. I have four grandchildren, ages from seven down to two. I have three grown children who are all married, uh, age range from 39 to 33. I have two hobbies, skiing in the winter and climbing and hiking in the summer because I live 50 miles east of Seattle up in the mountains. We get 500 inches of snow every year and there's still two feet of snow on the ground, but we're still skiing, so it's all good. And I have one wife of 45 years. It'll be 45 years in September. We're happily married and thrilled about that. And uh, because I ski, I want to kind of explain how I came to the book of Ecclesiastes by sharing a story with you. I write books just like John does and was pastor of a growing church, was doing well, loved my work, loved my family, loved my children, loved my life, loved my health. And uh, one of the places where I go to write books I was up there and I took the uh, afternoon off one day to ski. And so if we look at this video, you can kind of see where I was. It was like a perfect day for skiing for me because it was sunny and it was a Wednesday and it was fresh powder, there's nobody there. And I'm an introvert, so I got to ride the lift alone and I was very happy. So I'm skiing, you know, riding the chair up, going down, up, down. And then as I'm going up chair two, Really, the voice of God speaks to me and says, hey, Richard, enjoy this moment because it's not going to last forever. You won't always be able to ski. And I thought, well, that's a weird kind of depressing thing to hear on the chairlift from God. But I skied down and then, uh, you know, again, God says, speaks to me on the way up on the, on the next run. And God says, hey, and I, I want you to take note too, these ski lifts, they won't always be here either. Pay attention. Enjoy this moment. It won't last. I found this really annoying by then, so I thought, well, if I go and ski on chair two instead of chair eight, God won't speak to me. But I went over to chair two, and indeed God spoke there as well and said, these mountains won't be here. These trees won't be here. Nothing lasts. Wow. Finished skiing, went back to the little log cabin where I spent time writing, cooked a meal, lit some candles, and spent the evening reading three times straight through from cover to cover the little book of Ecclesiastes. 
And it changed my life. It's now my favorite book in the Old Testament. And I'm happy to be here to share a little bit with you. Ecclesiastes is powerful to me because it's written by a king and it offers kingly wisdom, not priestly wisdom. Priestly wisdom is formulaic. If you do this, this will happen, right? Five ways to raise perfect kids. Eight ways to lose 20 pounds. Six-minute abs. Formulaic. Great. And there's truth in formulas. But kingly wisdom is different Kingly wisdom deals with pragmatic realities and articulates, hey, the formulas don't always work, and yet you can live as a person of hope. Two phrases govern this guy's writings. The first phrase is the phrase under the sun, and under the sun is used 30 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And what it means is this. I'm going to tell you, says Solomon, the author, this is life as it really is. This is reality, okay? And it's not vision or ideals or aspirational goals, it's this phrase under the sun that says, in the real world, sometimes good people die young and rotten people live to be 100. <laughs> in the real world, you can do everything right and your kids might still stray from the faith. In the real world, people of faith love the same God but don't agree on vaccines, on politics, on theology. And sometimes the disagreements are so profound, even among people of faith in the same family, that they don't have Thanksgiving together. It's a reality in my own Congregation back home in Seattle. In the real world, bad people rise to power sometimes. Good people rise to power sometimes. But sometimes you don't know who's good and bad until they rise to power. And even then you don't agree. That's the real world. So Ecclesiastes, the reason I love it is it's so refreshing. It's not an advertising pitch. It's not a marketing ploy. It's like raw honesty about pain and suffering and loss and injustice that sets the table so that we, taking a good hard look at life, say, wow, I need something better, and that leads me to Jesus. So very refreshing. The front door of the good news for 99% of Americans, I'm, I'm convinced, is Ecclesiastes. Because we all know life isn't working. We all know it. doesn't matter where you are politically, theologically, on the spectrum of age. We look around and we say, something's broken. Solomon helps us take a good hard look at what's broken. Second word, besides under the sun, that governs the book is the, is the word hovel in Hebrew. And the word means emptiness. But the, you know, the best translation of it would be this. Finding meaning in life is like trying to grab smoke. There it is. Where'd it go? And how much do we spend in our lives time trying to grab smoke? And then we open our hand and we say, <laughs> you know, where to go? So we live in this age where uh, philosophers have called it a post-truth age because we're saturated with this kind of avalanche of AI and false news and narratives and advertising and marketing ploys so that people are cynical regarding knowing what's true. And Solomon comes along and he says, listen, set aside philosophy, set aside even for a moment, you know, theological debates and those kind of things, and let's just take a good hard look at reality by looking at the under the sun realities and, 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 and the hobble pursuits in those under the sun realities, and let's ask, how's this working out for us? And there are two under the sun realities that I'm going to talk to you about this morning, and they provide the question to which Jesus is the answer. And these realities are undeniable. They resonate with everybody in the room and every person on the planet, actually. And yet we spend a great deal of time trying to avoid thinking about these realities. And so uh, these two, the two realities are these, and they're kind of depressing. I'll warn you at the outset, right? The first under the sun reality, nothing that we want to keep lasts. And the second under the sun reality, nothing uh, that we uh, want to avoid goes away. Nothing we want to keep lasts. Nothing we want to avoid goes away. The big question that governs the whole book is in verse 3 of chapter 1. What advantage does a man have in all his work that he does under the sun? What advantage does he have? It's a good question. And so here's the, here's, the, here's the framing question. I get up every morning and I go do a thing, right? I, I have a job. 
I go, I go do my job. I come home, I have kids to raise, and so I get home, there's a house to clean, there are meals to cook, there, there are children to care for. There's, at this point in the season of our lives, in April, there's Little League games all day Saturday, as Neil said. There may be soccer as well, there may be cello lessons as well, and there's grades to get, and there's phones to monitor for your kids so that they don't destroy themselves by overindulging. And there's video game addictions, and there's this desire to get our children into the best schools. And we're working hard, and we're praying hard, and we're, and we're studying hard, and we're trying our best to live the very best life. And Solomon says, time out. Let's just stop and ask one gigantic question. Why are we doing all of this? That's the question, and he'll get to the answer, but first he articulates these two realities, and the first under the sun reality is this, nothing that we want to keep lasts, this is verse 6 and 7, blowing toward the sun and uh, uh, turning toward the, blowing toward the south and turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along, and on its circular course the wind returns, the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full to the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again, and what Solomon is saying in those two verses is this, He's saying, listen, uh, this world is constantly changing. So because of that, nothing that you want to keep lasts. The question in verse 3 is this. There's kind of this embedded thought that if I work hard enough, right, if I do, if I do all the right things, I can get to a point in my, in my life where I say, now I've got it. I've got it. My kids are believers I'm healthy, nobody's addicted, we've paid off the mortgage, life is as it should be, mic drop, done. Oh my God, we want that, and we go after it, and Solomon says, hey, wait a minute, just know this, even if you get there, even if you get there, what? It's not going to last. We're like a guy in Luke 13, or Luke 12, who, he's a farmer, and he had a good year, and then he had another good year, and then he had another good year, and so he built barns, and he leveraged his assets, and he invested well, and he got to a point in his life where at the end of Luke 13, uh, verse 18, he says, hey, guess what? Boom, I've arrived. Debt's paid. I can now just chill for the rest of my days and live in this bliss of having built the life that I went after and just enjoy it. And then God says to him, you fool, this night you're dying and you neglected your soul the whole way along. You tried to build a life, but it didn't work. And so here, this is the danger for all of us. We can work at building the perfect life. We can work on our finances and we worry about investing well. And we can work on our health and take our fish oil and eat our greens and avoid, you know, all the bad things that we're told are bad for us and, and we can go running. It can be we can work on our marriage through uh, marriage seminars and seven habits to build a healthy marriage. Do it, do it, do it. We can work on our children. And we may even get there, but here's the point, it doesn't last. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I go out and look at avalanche lilies every year in the place where I live because as soon as the snow melts in the mountains... The first flower we see, and we don't see any flowers until the middle of May in the mountains, but the first flowers we see are avalanche lilies. The snow disappears, and then these, these little lilies come up, and so about the second week of May every year, I'm going to go out into the snow, and I'll see where the snow has melted, and on day one, I'll see the germination of an avalanche lily. And on day two, I'll see the stem. And on, on day three, I'll see the lily... And on day four, the lily will look tired. And on day five, the lily will be lilted. And on day six, the lily will be gone. And I go every year. And here's what happens. Every year they rise. Every year they're glorious. Every year they're gone. Why do I do that? It's a super reminder for me that nothing lasts. Money disappears. And even if you manage to keep it, you disappear and the money stays here. Right? And even in the best marriage, mine will be 45 years in September, unless my wife and I fall in a crevasse together or die in an avalanche together or something like that, one of us is going to be left alone. 
And kids move from innocence and dependence in, uh, uh, to, to their teen years where they want nothing to do with us. And, and, and then uh, they, they leave home and then somehow they think we're wise again and they return and then we have fellowship again. And then they have grandchildren and then they want us to be, you know, surrogate parents as, as grandparents. <laughs> And, and, and that's the way it works, but it's never, ever, ever the same, right? And if you have a job, you may love your job. And if you love your job, I have bad news, it doesn't last. If you hate your job, I have good news, it doesn't last. <laughs> I think my job was as good as it gets, but it didn't last. I'm now retired. And it was my choice, but things changed so dramatically I only retired recently, and when I was there to speak on Easter Sunday, a couple of people came up to me and said, hey, are you a new pastor on staff here? Because I've been gone long enough that they don't recognize me. And I was like, I'm not new, I'm the guy, but I'm not the guy. I'm not the guy anymore. Marriage, kids, work, nation states, economic systems, Nothing lasts. My dad died at 53 of a lung disease. He didn't smoke a cigarette ever. Jean Clement died at 117. She stopped smoking at the age of 104 because her eyes were so bad she lit her finger on fire one time trying to smoke her cigarettes. <laughs> and so if you think there's a formula for capturing health or wealth or long life, or perfect kids. If you think there's a formula, you're kidding yourself. If we're fortunate, we get to a place in our lives where there are moments of shalom. Shalom kind of represented by this redwood tree that you can see here. Like this beautiful place where you can just kind of enjoy and celebrate. There are seasons in our lives and, and, and moments in our lives of perfect shalom. Enjoy those moments. But recognize they won't last. After 9-11, uh, I took my oldest daughter to hear the Seattle Symphony at uh, Safeco Field where our Seattle Mariners try to win games occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there were 42,000 people there. It was a powerful uh, production of Mozart's Requiem. And my youngest daughter was six at the time and the entire event had escaped her. And so that morning, I'm with my daughter, and she's, she's crying, and we're grieving. She's in high school. And then my young daughter, who's in kindergarten, you know, uh, we're sitting on a trampoline in the afternoon, <laughs> and we're, we're looking at clouds in the sky. And I'm still viscerally wounded from the morning and, the, and, the, and this worship with Mozart and this prayer for our world. And my daughter's clueless, my young daughter, and she's just looking at the clouds, and she goes, oh, that one's Winnie the Pooh. Oh, that one's Donald Duck. Oh, there's Kermit the Frog. What do you think that one looks like, Daddy? And I said to her, for better or worse, I said, you know, uh, life's not always going to be like this. I said, you know, your, your older sister, she's already dating. She's getting married someday. Your brother probably will too. And she, she rolled over and she put her head right here on my chest and she says, oh, Daddy. They may get married. And she hugs me, but I never want to leave you. <laughs> I start crying. <laughs> and I was just like this, man, if I could just freeze this moment of perfect innocence before phones and body image issues and competitions and disappointment and sexuality and confusion and money, and politics, and war, and violence. Can we just be that innocent forever? Here's the answer from Solomon, no. <laughs> Nothing you want to keep last. Listen, you get great moments of shalom. Enjoy them. I do. I love hanging out with my, with my kids. We, they're grown and married, but we're, our house is just big enough that we can all still be there for Christmas Eve. And since my kids were young... Just before Christmas, at 11 p.m. on December 24th, we always turn on um, the Muppet Christmas Carol and watch it on TV. 
And now it's a tradition not just for us, but for our kids and their spouses and all the grandkids. And we're all there and there's this beautiful song, Bless Us All. And every time I hear it, I look around and I go, wow, what a gift. But I also know I won't enjoy this gift forever. I'll be called home. I also know things change. So enjoy moments of shalom, but accept this reality. Nothing I'm going to keep less. Here's the second kind of problem, if we could address it this way. The second problem is nothing that we want to get rid of goes away. Nothing we want to get rid of goes away. Look at verses 9 and 10. That which has been is that which will be. That which has been done is that which will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which, of which one might say, see, it's new? It's already existed. Nothing we want to get rid of goes away. We, there's a lot we don't agree on in this world. But, but these truths are truths that we can agree on, and particularly the second reality, nothing we want to get rid of disappears. It's just true. What do I mean by that? Well, here's the reality. There will always be wars and rumors of wars. Always. 20th century saw the rise of racism, both in America and Europe in the 30s and 40s, along with totalitarian communism in Russia and China. And the combined effect of all of, all of those ideologies were wars, and the combined effect of the wars were 50 million dead. 50 million dead in a century in war. And you'd like to think that in the wake of that much bloodshed, all of us would wake up and come to our collective senses and say, you know what? Never again. But it doesn't work that way. There will always be war. So the reality is this, there will always be cries for peace, longings for peace, songs about peace, but another war, always. I went to hear James Taylor in May in Seattle with my wife. We're old enough that we remember him when he was young and popular. He's 80-something now, and he's still doing concerts. And at the end of his concert, James Taylor had this quartet and they, with his son, and they, they sang this beautiful prayer for peace. And one of the reasons it brought tears to my eyes wasn't just because it was so beautiful, but because it, it, it was so, and forgive my cynicism, so what, pointless. Do you understand what I mean? Sing for peace. I get it. I want it. But I understand not in this life, not in this world, there will all, Jesus said it. Always war. So there will always be a Bob Dylan, always a James Taylor, always a Joni Mitchell. There will always be candlelight vigils. There will always be thoughts and prayers. There will always be book clubs. There will always be, you know, a UN. There will be longings for peace, but there will always be a Pol Pot. Always be a Stalin. Always be a Hitler. Always be a Hamas. Always be a Putin. That's the way it is. Oh, and the poor? Here's Jesus. The poor you always have with you. So homelessness is also not a new problem. And, and how about slavery and racism and oppression? Y yes, always. Human trafficking, still present in the 21st century. Still present in America. And so in addition to all the problems that don't go away, we live in a time when we already know the talking points. Do you understand what I mean by that? There will be a school shooting... And, and, and then the left is going to say, wow, we need gun control. The center is going to say, we need mental health uh, discussions and, and training and background checks. The right is going to talk about the Second Amendment. And we'll have this discussion, and nothing will change. And no one will be persuaded. And so we even stop listening to each other. It's as if we're all stuck in our own ideological ditches, convinced that we're fully right, and not only we right, but the other side is wrong, and not only is the other side wrong, the other side is dangerous. And so nothing changes except the rhetoric, which gets more violent and less charitable every year. And as a result of this, we collectively, not only as a nation, I can tell you because I travel globally and teach, not only as a nation, but globally, we are tribal, angry, and anxious. Because the world is not working. In America, it's a real reality. Men, the statistics are alarming. Men in America, there's four times higher now than just 10 years ago, four times higher, the number of men in America who say they have no close friends. Ten times higher. 
Suicides have risen by a third just in the last decade and risen by a much higher percentage among teenage girls, 60% of whom say they struggle with fear, anxiety, depression, and body image issues. 54% of Americans say nobody knows me well. More fights on airplanes, more shootings, more, 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 more. We want it to change. We know that there's a better life somehow, but nothing we want to get rid of disappears. Now, just before continuing, I got to give you some hope. Because <laughs> you're like this. Send this guy back to Seattle with his rain. <laughs> this is too depressing. I get it. I will just observe the gospel, like the more clearly we see how bad it is, the better and more appealing the gospel is. Does this make sense to you? Like, so share the bad news because it makes the good news even better. And what I mean by that is the good news is not just heaven when you die. The good news is in John 10, Jesus said this, I've come that you might have abundant life and that you might have it abundantly. This, this word life here is Zoe, and what Jesus is saying is, listen, I came so that though this is the world in which we live, I can give you the tools, friends, to rise above this so that you now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, filled with the resurrected life of Jesus, you can live in this life as a person of hope in the midst of despair, generosity in the midst of greed, justice in the midst of oppression, life in the midst of death, that's your calling, amen? amen? We have to move into that direction. And that's what Jesus will show us how to do as we continue in Ecclesiastes these next several weeks. Now, if we've looked at the bad news, those two things, we, we can't keep what we like, we can't get rid of what we don't like. What's the hobble response? In other words, what's the world's response to this? Well, the world's response is a couple of things. First response is this, let's fix it. Like, we're smart, we're humans. Through technology, through science, through AI, through political upheaval, through different economic systems, through protests, through going to war, you know, let's find a way forward. But look at uh, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, right? He says here in verse 14, I've seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all of it's vanity and striving after wind. All of it is hovel. In other words... We try and fix things, but in spite of culture wars, in spite of political posturing, in spite of, you know, debates, in spite of after World War I, the League of Nations, after World War II, the UN, in spite of all of it, we can't escape the pain. That's the problem. We can't fix it. And so we try and fix it and fail. And then another group says, you know what? We, it can never be fixed, so forget it. Let the world be what the world is, on fire. Here's what we'll do. We'll escape from the pain. And there's three ways we escape from the pain. Work, money, sex, and pleasure. Let's just talk about all three real quickly here. How do we escape by work? Well, this is really interesting. Uh, in uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, Solomon says this. So, in this broken world, this is what I did to cope. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself uh, from which to uh, irrigate a, a, a forest of growing trees. So I worked. Now listen, this is good work that he's doing. He's creating. And you're made to work. Genesis uh, chapter 1 is where work is assigned to humans, not after the fall. So work is a good thing. We're made to work. He's doing work. It's good work, just like many of you are doing good work. If you're in farming, you're creating. If you're in tech, you're creating. If you're in business, you're creating. If you're working, in some sense, you're creating. And if you're fortunate, you like your work. But understand again, work is hovel because it doesn't last. So even though you work, don't put all your eggs in the work basket. And this is such an important word for Americans who love our work. When I travel in Europe and I say to somebody in conversation casually, hey, what do you do for a living? They go, why would you ask such a stupid question? 
I say, what do you mean? He says, well, we love when we're not working not to talk about work. And yet in America, of course, it doesn't matter where you are, on a plane, anywhere you go, what's the first question we ask? What do you do? As if that defines us. Don't let it define you. Second, uh, money. Look at verse 7. He says, I bought male and female slaves, and I had homeborn slaves, and I possessed flocks and herds more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem, and I collected for myself silver and gold uh, from the treasuries of kings and provinces, and provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. What he's saying here is, is that I'm prosperous. And this applies to us in the sense that we live in the most prosperous nation on the planet, and yet we have to understand that though money is good and though God wants to provide for us, understand this, money also, just like work, can never be our source of identity or basis of uh, satisfaction and fulfillment. It just can't. I was a pastor on an island for a number of years, and, and on the island, uh, I spoke one particular Sunday out of Philippians 4 on Paul's thing regarding contentment. This is where Paul says, I've learned to be content in any situation, whether my plate is full or empty, if I have a lot or I have a little. He says, doesn't matter to me, I have learned what? I'm content, right? And afterwards, a guy came up to me. He was visiting from the Bay Area. I was in Washington State. And he said, hey, uh, I have to talk to you because... I want what you just talked about. And so I went to uh, the house where he was staying. It was the house of his father. And this guy had made a huge amount of money in tech in the Bay Area. And so I'm in this beautiful custom-built home overlooking uh, uh, the water that runs between uh, the United States and Canada. You can see San, uh, on my island, San Juan, you can see across the Puget Sound to uh, Victoria and Vancouver Island in Canada. And this, in this water, there's always, you know, beautiful killer whales and bald eagles. Like this guy's property is premier. This house is premier. He's got a wine collection on the wall, premier. He's got a library over here, premier. He pulls food out of the refrigerator, premier. Everything, you could not even imagine wanting more. And then he tells me a story. He says, here's the thing. I made all this money, you know, and, and we've been living in the Bay Area. And this is, this is now I'm quoting him. He says, this is, what I, this is my life. I've known stress. I've known lust for power. I've known lust for pleasure. I've, lo- I've known lust for market share. I've had enough wealth to go to orgies in the California Redwoods and sip wine with other tech giants. But I haven't known in my life one moment of contentment, not one. I'm never content. I always want more and more and more. It's like a drug. How can I get free from this drug? And then strangely, ironically, he says, I'll give you any amount of money if you can make me content. (laughs) And I was like this, I don't need money. But I said to him, uh, the first thing you have to do is understand (laughs) that what you're doing is, remember? (sighs) Hovel. You're never going to find contentment there. You know, the Greek word for mammon, we translate sometimes as money in the Bible. The word mammon, though, literally is this, a demon that encourages greed and endless dissatisfaction. So if your identity is your wealth or your properties or your 401K or your financial security, if your identity is your work, and then sex and pleasure is the next one. What does he say? He said, oh, I had many, you know, concubines, verse 8. Then I became great and increased in all who preceded me, all kinds of sexual pleasures. Verse 10, anything my eye wanted, I didn't say no. Pleasure. Marianne Layden is the co-director of sexual trauma program at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And I'm quoting her now. She says, you know, we have a discussion in America about the fentanyl crisis, and it is a crisis. She says, but fentanyl is not the most dangerous drug in America. She says, you want to know the most dangerous drug? The most dangerous drug in America uh, that's existing today is the drug of pornography. (laughs) She says, this is the drug that's pumped into your house 24-7 free, and children know how to access it better than their parents. 
It's the perfect delivery system uh, for a whole generation of addicts, if that's what we're going to create. Not only addicts, but addicts who, by virtue of their addiction to porn, uh, create a life uh, riddled with shame, withdrawal, loss of productivity, loss of cre creativity, and arrested social development skills. Work? Money? Pleasure? Nothing. So here's a question then. If fixing it doesn't work and escaping it doesn't work, what's left? I'm going to just pause right here and say this. Unless you're in Christ, there are no other options. If you're not in Christ, you look at the world and the mess that is the world and reflexively you will, go, you will choose one of these two paths. I'm going to become... Uh, uh, Greta Thornburg and fix the climate by rowing across the Atlantic, I'm going to fix it somehow, or, you know, I'm going to say, forget it, and I'm going to live my own life and build my own castle and enjoy my own pleasures and ignore the fact that the world is on fire. What do I do? Do I fix the world that's on fire or ignore the world that's on fire? Like, what are the options? And neither one works. That's what Solomon is saying. So what's his conclusion then? Get ready. This is crazy. The solution to life under the sun. There's, this is what he says. Verse 24 of 2. There's nothing better than, I've decided, than for a man to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This I've seen is from the hand of God. For who can have enjoyment without him? And then later in the book, he's going to say it over and over again. He's going to say, let your beard always be flowing down with oil. Let your clothes always be white. Make sure you laugh. Make sure you love your wife. Make sure you enjoy your food. Make sure you enjoy the sunshine. Make sure you enjoy your work. And so there's this strange call, which is this, the one true thing that Solomon calls us to, enjoy life. Really? How? How? You just told me nothing works. You said under the sun, everything is havel. And you said we can't fix it. And if we try and escape, our attempts at escape will destroy us. And now you're telling me to be happy? That's weird. Please connect the dots. That's what I'm here to do. So here's the thing. Solomon is saying, yeah, the problems are real. But understand, the problems of this world are passing away. 1 John 2, 17. The world is passing away. And it's lusts. So we live in this fog. And this fog is nasty. And that's understandable that we would get depressed. And that we would try and fix it. Or, conversely, we'd take these escape paths of, you know, money or work or pleasure... But what he's saying here is understand, you don't need to react to this in either of those ways because this is not the most profound and deepest lasting reality. None of it. All of it's fog. It's passing away. Uh, if we can look at this next slide, I'll just tell you a story that kind of shows you how this works. If you look at the clouds there uh, that are down at the bottom, that's kind of a river valley. That's where I live. I live in those clouds. And... I took this picture one morning because my general uh, morning workout routine is to wake up, put on ski, skis that are capable of skiing uphill and, and skiing uphill, and then getting my reward by taking the skins off the skis and skiing down. So that's what I do for a workout. It's fun. But it's, it's never fun to wake up and it's foggy because I'm like this. I don't know if it's going to be foggy the whole way up or if it's just going to be foggy a little way, I don't know. But I, but I wake up, and I see the fog, and I'm like this. No, nah, I think it's better stay in bed, right? 28 degrees, foggy. Uh, no, I think I'll stay in bed. And then there's this piece of me saying, no, no, you don't know. You don't know, you don't know. Maybe you, maybe you can get above the fog. And so I put my, my skis on, and I head up. And pretty soon I can see, ah, there's going to be a ceiling, and then I'm above it, and then I'm really above it, and the sun rises, 
And then it's glorious, and I'm like this. Wow, I'm so glad I did this. Instead of staying in bed, because had I stayed in bed, all I would have seen was the fog. Now, how does this apply to you and me? Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In other words, you live here in a world of war and cynicism and AI and eugenics and political division and strife and fear and anxiety and body image. That's where you live. And this is what uh, Solomon is saying. Don't live there. You're in it, but not what? Of it. You're not of it. Don't live there. Rise above it. You become a person of hope in the midst of despair. How do you do that? Keep seeking. Keep seeking the things that are above. Now, what does that mean? There's an eternal reality, and it's here now for you. It's not just heaven when you die. Right now, you can live as a person of hope because you are filled with nothing less than the life of Christ. And so you go out from this building and you become a force in uh, Brownsburg and beyond, a force of healing and hope and justice and mercy and generosity and hospitality, not a person of division and polarization and, and uh, political posturing and fear. That's fog. <sighs> it's passing away. This is eternal. Live there. Amen? Amen. That's what we need desperately, all of us. In one of the books I wrote, I said this, no matter what happens outwardly in our world, the inner realities of Christ's power and beauty and generosity and justice and compassion become our bedrock. They increasingly define us because believing them to be true, we begin to see and know them in our experience. We don't wait to see before we believe. We believe in order that we might see. That's the life of faith, and people who practice it consistently have a decent shot at falling asleep in the boat, even in the storms, as Jesus did. We can live as people of hope because we have the mind of Christ, the eyes of Christ. And how do we do that? I'm going to encourage you to practice uh, what I call forest meditation. If we go to the next slide, during COVID, I wrote a little book called Forest Faith because I was so struck by how the trees are always doing the same thing, no matter who's in political power, they do, they do the same thing every day. What do they do? They receive gifts from above, rain and sunshine and snow. Their roots go deep every day, extending deeper into the soil to draw up nutrients and water. Their roots also connect with other trees so that they can communicate with one another and share resources. And each tree is called to be a blessing. If you have wood in your house, a tree has blessed you. If you're a bird, a tree has blessed you. If you're breathing right now, it's because trees are exhaling oxygen that we inhale. So every day, we can apply this. Christ above me, I'm receiving gifts. Christ beneath me, I'm rooted and grounded in love. Christ around me, I'm connected with other people. And Christ within me, I'm called. And every morning I get up and I have to make a cup of coffee. And then in my meditation, I, I pray this way. Christ above me, I'm receiving. Christ beneath me, I'm rooted. Christ around me, I'm connected. Christ within me, I'm called. And I'm going to invite you to do that right now just with me. Would you, can we do this together? With the hand motions. It'll help you. <laughs> Christ above me, I'm receiving. Christ beneath me, I'm rooted. Christ around me, I'm connected. Christ within me, I'm called. How did this become real for me? Hovel became real for me because when I was in high school, uh, I grew up in a really kind of classic Christian, middle-class home. My dad was a school principal. My mom was a stay-at-home mom making chocolate chip cookies. And life was good. I played in the marching band in high school. I was popular. I made good grades. I was looking forward to whatever the future would be. And I came home uh, as a senior in high school from a football game, and my mom said to me, hey, uh, listen, your dad has fallen into a coma very suddenly. He's unconscious in the hospital. The doctors don't think he'll live till the morning. If you want to see him, you need to go now to the hospital. My dad, I'll tell you, my dad was my best friend, my best friend. I talk, he was the only one I talked to about God, faith, sex, women, vocation. The only one. Not, I didn't get on well with my mom. And he was gone by morning. And then I uh, got mad at God. Why, like, how do you take 
the one in my life that's a rock for me, my father. My senior year in high school was very difficult. My first year in college was even worse. I decided I'm going to take a vacation from God and I'm going to become an architect and just uh, make buildings because you never know how long you're going to last here. At least something will still be here when I'm dead if I become an architect. So I go off to study, study architecture and uh, I'm starting to have health issues from my depression and my anger and all the stuff I'm storing inside of me. And my relationship with my mom has deteriorated. And though outwardly I'm making good grades and I'm in the marching band and I'm popular, inwardly I'm clueless. I don't think architecture is what I'm made to do, but I don't know, but I don't have any guidance because I'm taking a vacation from God because I'm mad at God. And then in the mercy of God, a cute blonde invited me to a ski retreat. And she said, are you going to this retreat? I said, are you going? She said, yeah, I'm going. I said, if you're going, I'm going. And I, and I went. And then uh, on Friday night in February 1976, the preacher preached on Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 27. And he said, don't let the, the wise man boast of his wisdom. Don't let the mighty man boast of his might. Don't let this... Strong man boasts of his strength, the rich man of his riches. But if anyone would boast, let him boast in this, that he knows me, God, intimately. And then this guy, he, this way he says, knowing God is the only thing that will sustain you in this life. It's the only thing. Everything else is temporary. You must make knowing God the number one pursuit of your whole life. Knowing God. And then... Out of the 200 students in the room, he points at me. He says, there's seven in the room. You're hourly successful, popular, making good grades academically, but you're depressed, you're angry, and you haven't got a clue what to do with your life. You need to make knowing God the goal of your life. Okay, I will. I went out, I got down on my knees, I prayed, I said, God, I don't know what this means, but I've been running from you, I've been so mad at you for my dad being gone. But then I was crying and I said this, I need a father. Will you be my father? And he was like this, yeah, I'll be your father. Changed my major, changed universities, changed states, moved from California to Seattle. I wouldn't be here today if the reality of Havel losing my dad hadn't motivated me to make knowing God the number one thing in my life. Some of you need that right now. So let's pray together. Father, we need all that you have to give us and so our prayer, Father, this morning is, a, is that we would face full on the hovel of our world and the hovel of our own personal world and the hovel of our hearts. And Father, having faced that, that we would then come to you just like I did in 1976 and say, God, I can't take it anymore. I'm so tired of trying to keep all the plates spinning, so tired of trying to fix the world, so tired of the addictions that have come about in my life because I've tried to escape the world. I'm tired of it all, Father. And I want to make knowing you the only thing that matters in my life. Would you lead me there so that every day I can say this, Christ, you're above me, I'm receiving. Thank you. Every, every gift from you, thank you for the sunshine, for my family, for, for, for the food, for the fellowship. Thank you that I'm rooted in you, Father. Thank you that you love me infinitely, unconditionally. Thank you that I'm connected in a family of faith and connected with my neighbors and my co-workers. And thank you, Father, most of all, that you've given me a calling to be a person of hope in a world of despair. I receive it all from you with gratitude. And thank you for the adventure that awaits as I follow you, praying in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. A joy to be with you. Hey, if you enjoyed that message, you're going to love Richard's books. Uh, take a picture of this slide. There's a QR code on there. It'll take you to his Amazon page. You can order any of his resources. Um,
Before we go today, just gonna dismiss you really quickly, but this first time I, I heard the, this message from Richard, it reminded me of a quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, if I find in myself desires that nothing in this world can satisfy, and, and if you will be serious about your pursuit of happiness in life, you will reach that point, then the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. And that is true of you today. You were made to be above the fog. You were made for another world. So I just wanna encourage you, if you don't yet have that hope that Richard found, uh, that so many of us here have found in Christ alone, if you don't yet have that hope, we will have pastors at the front here at the end of the service and keep investigating this, keep joining us here every weekend. Uh, for those of us who are believers, this is why Jesus said when people were saying, we're gonna kill you, he said, hey, my kingdom's not of this world. You know, I'm not gonna fight against you in the physical realm because my kingdom is an eternal kingdom. It's of a higher, it's just a higher order. It's gonna be, you know, people from every century of history. And then Jesus said to his followers in Matthew 6, verse 33, seek first that kingdom, seek first the kingdom of God. And so for those of us who do know Christ, uh, this message from Ecclesiastes is this reminder, are we truly seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? If you're anything like me, it's, it's easy to make a big burst of I'm all out for God and his kingdom. And then slowly you start to build your own castle. Slowly you start to either escape the world again or put your faith in your resources or your health or something else. If you're a believer, choose with me today. Let's be a people who continue to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Well, if you're a guest with us, we do have a gift for you. It's out in the lobby at our Connection Corner. We're so honored that you're here with us. Church, I love you so much. I can't wait to continue this series next week. Have a great week. I'll see you then.